Okay, turn turn with me to John chapter 15, if you will. And this morning I've got a message called pruning time. Pruning time. You might, as you might guess, I did a little pruning yesterday, and it made me think. I always work out in the garden, get some time to think and pray and listen to God and. I want you to uh, really think about pruning. Most of you in here have at least some type of garden or something to prune or to tend to. And I want you to think about God's illustration in nature today. John 15, we're going to begin with verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. As we begin this passage of scripture, I want you to look carefully at the illustration Jesus gave. I am a true believer that the modern day world largely misses out on the Word of God in its meaning because they're no longer an agrarian society. Because we, do no, we no longer garden and tend to grow in our own food, we misunderstand the Bible and completely miss its meaning and completely don't grasp it. So I, I read through this and I thought about what I was doing yesterday. Pruning time is never fun. It's never something I look forward to. And it's hard work. I ended up, I've got a, I've got a bandage on the back of my hand from, from getting cut. It uh, was dangerous because several times I had to get up high in the trees and when I got through, it didn't look good. <laughs> I took Angie up this morning and said, uh, well, well, you just was really at it. Yeah, you just really went at that. <laughs> Sometimes when you get through with pruning, it looks like, wow, I just have no idea what that, what's going to happen here with this tree. You prune it when it's dead. You prune it when it's in, in the dormant stage and then when spring comes and everything pops out then the tree begins to grow. In this instance it's a vine, it's, a, it's the great vine. He said, Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Now by him telling you that he's the true vine it tells me that there can be other vines other things you cling to, other things you abide in, other things that you become part of, other things that you put your hope in. This is the true vine that you need to be putting your hope in, that you need to be abiding in. You don't need to be in some other vine. You don't need to be part of some other vine. You need to be part of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the true vine. You so those branches that rub in the wind will make a, uh, a diseased place on both of those limbs. There's no space there. Sometimes we try to cram too much stuff in our lives and we try to fill our whole day of, of 24 hours full of way too much. Yeah. Way too much. It may all be good things. It may be healthy limbs but they're growing toward each other and we need to make sure that we prune those things out. Things that are going toward each other. And the other thing I looked for was diseased limbs. Limbs that already had dead spots on them or blight on them or some disease or something that that I could tell even in the dormant stage that it was not going to be productive and I trimmed those out. And when I got through I ended up with fruit trees that had a certain beginning because it's dormant, you can't see the leaves, so you have to imagine what's going to happen. 
Now your life needs to be that way. You need to even see beyond what you can see now. You need to see beyond the way it is now. Look for the future of, of your life and when you're, when you're preparing things. Amen? You need to make sure that you are doing things and everything in your power to be fruitful and, and to prosper the way God, God said. So in verse 2 he said, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So there's a reason that the husbandman does this, and that reason is he wants fruit. Now we have some trees that we grow for shade, right? We're not talking about those. We're talking about the ones that God grows for fruit, and that's us. Right. We're not grown for shade. I know a lot of people that have been shade trees in the church. <laughs> Amen? That's, right. that's all they did was they cast a shadow over something. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that what a shade tree does? It shades out the truth, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Shade tree. Don't be a shade tree. You need to be a fruit tree. And if you're a fruit tree, you're going to get pruned. And things are going to get pruned. And I'm going to upset some people, but I'm going to say people will get pruned. People will get pruned from you and from the church. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. And that is another way of pruning. That is light pruning. That is trimming. That is caring for. Purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So if you're a branch, if you're abiding in the vine, the true vine, and you're getting a little pruned, hurts a little bit, there's a reason for it. Amen? Amen. Our life is not going to be that we are put here and never suffer at all. Our life is going to be there are going to be some things happen to us. I've got some other scripture that we're going to look at in just a minute. Talk about that. <coughs> Verse 4, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except you by it abide in the vine. No more can you abide except you abide in me. You know, it's important that you see no more can you abide except you abide in me. Those of you who can still remember your B.C. years, before Christ years, can remember that before you were saved, you were unfruitful. But you probably had some other kind of fruit. Right? You know, there's other kind of fruit that's not good fruit to eat. Can you, can you tell us an example? And can you tell us some kind of fruit that you wouldn't want to eat? Real fruit? Yeah. What kind of fruit of yeah, nature? Well, there's the holly berries. They're a fruit. Right. But you sure don't want to eat them. Right. Mistletoe berries. Mistletoe berries. A lot of things have berries that you don't you don't eat, right? Mm -hmm. So that was you as in your B.C. years, right? Right. And he said, no more can you except you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now I can read that entire passage to a lot of people, and all they hear is, you can ask what you will and it should be done. You're laughing because you know it's true. A lot of people, they read through this and they're looking for something for them. They're looking for something for me. I'm look, I want something. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. I can ask what I will and you'll do it. But the whole passage says you have to abide in him and his words abide in you. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. If. We don't like that word if, do we? We don't like the con conditions that if we abide in him and his word abides in us. If that happens, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be the, my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments... You shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that, everybody read it out loud, that my joy might, be, might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. 
this whole passage, there's a reason for it. The fruit and the joy that is supposed to be in your life. I got to tell you, I can look at a lot of people's lives and they can tell me with their mouth, I'm a Christian, I'm, my life's on fire for God. You know, I, you know, do you go to church? Yes, I go to church. Do you read your Bible? Yes, I read my Bible. Do you love your enemy? Do I, yeah, oh yeah, I love my enemy. Uh, and then they have no joy. Then it doesn't, it's not so. Right. It's not so. Amen? Amen. Because he said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Do you know anybody, including yourself, that doesn't have full joy? You know? If you don't have full joy, or you know somebody that doesn't have full joy, there's something wrong. Right. Amen? That's right. If we planted an entire vineyard, if we decided to grow grapes and process raisins, let's say we was, we was going to be the Shepherd's Hill Raisin Farm. That sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> Shepherd's Hill like raisins. raisins. That's right. We're going we're gonna to grow raisins. We're going to grow a crop on the vine. And we planted row after row of vines. We put all the trellises up it takes to get vines up off the ground. We went through, and at the end of the year, we had one grape. Could we really call ourselves a vineyard? In harvest time, we've gone through that whole year of work, and we get down to it, and we have one grape. Are we going to celebrate over that grape? I mean, there's not even enough for Angie and I to share if we've got one grape, is it? You know, sometimes when we have just a handful of something on a new tree, we get, we've got two apples off a brand new tree. She gets one, and I get one, and we try it together. That's our thing we do. We, it's our first whatever kind of fruit off of that tree and we share it. We couldn't share one grape. I mean, we wouldn't rejoice over that. You've got no reason to rejoice if you haven't been abiding in the vine. If you haven't been fruitful. If, you, if your day is like this. you got your arms crossed. you got a sour look on your face. You, go, you get up in the morning and you're grumpy. You know, you just you're hateful. To everybody around you and and you just don't just didn't even want to get up today I just don't enjoy living anymore there's no fun in life everything's just dreadful you know what you're not in the vine you're not in the vine if you are in the vine you need some heavy pruning you need some heavy pruning because if I've got a vine that I've got out in my vineyard and it's not producing I'm gonna do something with it I'm gonna do something drastic with it if your life is not producing, you need to do something drastic with it. If you don't have full joy in your life, you need to look and see what kind of pruning you need to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now let's look at... Um, I've got several scriptures here, and I didn't necessarily write them in the order I wanted to give them. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Verse 17. Genesis 3, 17. <coughs> and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Now I want you to read through the curse of man here and see that the curse is for a reason and it is for man's good and for man's salvation. When you read that, you miss one small thing, and that is, cursed is the ground for thy sake. That the curse came, in Adam and Eve sinned, the curse came on both of them for their sake, or for their hope, or for their salvation. Amen? Now, after this day, 
Adam had to do some heavy gardening. He had to get in and do things he had never done before. He had to, by the sweat of his brow, he had to fight thorns and thistles, and and I probably got cut from some of that today, uh, yesterday. He had to work and do things that he had never had to do before. Now we have to get out and work in life. We have to work hard to make ends meet sometimes. And sometimes we just grumble. We miss the last lesson because we're just being grumpy about it. Yeah. I don't know why I couldn't have been born rich instead of good looking. <laughs> you know? We're, we're like that. We just get up and we just grumble about everything instead of saying, you know what? This is hard. But that's good. This work is hard, but it's good. There's a reason that work is hard. There's a lesson. You know, when I was going through school, I washed pots and pans, and I used to have some terrible back aches when I'd come home because I was bent over in the sink, you know, washing two foot tall pots, the industrial sized pots, and scraping down in there. And it, it might take 30 minutes to get a pot scrubbed out and get it clean. I mean, it was just back breaking work. And I made minimum wage. And you know what? That was a lesson. Go to school, Paul. Finish school, Paul. That was my lesson. Yeah. I can look back on that and say, you know what? It was worth it. It made me endure and get past that. And when you're gardening, you learn those kind of things. You learn, you know what? Well, I made a mistake here. I did things the hard way. I did things that were unproductive. Well, we're not going to do that again. Right. You know? I got up and I argued with my wife. I got up and, you know, was ornery all day long. Went to work, found out she had cried all day long because I left her. Ornery came home that afternoon and said, where's my supper, woman? And I learned. I learned a lesson. You know, the, the life's le our life's lessons are for a reason. And until we get it, we'll have to do it again. I remember a young Navy recruit who went into boot camp and told me that he uh, he got in and decided halfway through boot camp that he really didn't want to do this and then uh, he just kept trying to do everything to get kicked out and finally his officer, uh, commanding officer came in and said uh, I know what you're doing and it doesn't matter you're signed up for five years and it doesn't matter if you do this boot camp for five years you're mine when you get through with this nine weeks or whatever it was, then uh, and you don't pass, you get to do it again. Have you ever felt like God was doing you that way? That just over and over again, you had to go through the same. Why do I have to go? Why am I never got any money? Why? Have I, why am I always at odds with my wife? Why is I? You know why? 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 Why am I having to go through this? Why can I never seem to get well? Amen. Why can my life never get beyond this? Why can my marriage never be honest? Why can I never progress at work? Why can't why can't this happen? Maybe some pruning needs to take place. You may have way too much in your life, as I talked about, made too many limbs. They don't produce when you've got way too many limbs. Amen. You need some airflow. You need some sunlight coming in. You may have some diseased limbs that need to to be pruned out. I mean, there's all kind of reasons. And another reason, I don't think I've even mentioned this, is new growth. A lot of things only bear on new growth. Did you know that? Have you had any new growth in your life lately? Have you had anything new lately in your life? I look at pictures of these mega churches. I mean, it's like, it's like 10,000 people. If you looked at it from a distance, it's like you could see little dots for heads. And all I can see is they need to be pruned. Amen. You know, we've been lied to by the devil to think that if we get a lots of people and fill the pews and pack it to the walls, that's a good thing. Amen. You want to make sure that your vine is not packed to the walls. It's not hanging to the ground with limbs. Amen. You need to make sure there's some pruning going on. So Adam had a life's lesson, and we all have that same lesson, because the ground is still cursed for our sake. The man has 
rapidly try to get away from that, that agrarian thought, an agrarian society where we actually grow our own food, where we actually do things instead of going down and just get it in a can where it grew naturally, which a lot of people believe that, you know. You need to go down and get meat where it comes from naturally in the grocery. <laughs> I've heard people say that. Amen. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 and verse 17. Now this is another um, illustration that Paul was giving about uh, Israel or the Jews being God's people and the church. In verse 17 he says, And if some of the branches were broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Let well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, but be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. He was talking about Israel, and how Israel was pruned off. Amen. Amen. Israel was pruned off because of unbelief, and we at the church was grafted into the true vine. And here his illustration is the olive tree, which is a symbol of Israel. So we became God's people also. And I say also because Israel will be saved. Amen. And he said, don't boast about those branches laying on the ground. You're Okay, you get this mental image. You're grafted in. You are what he calls a wild olive tree grafted in so you are a wild olive tree and you were grafted in to the true vine amen and as you was grafted in you became part of that life now, I don't know if you've ever seen something being grafted but there's a cutting that takes place you take a cutting of something you take a small wedge you make a wedge cut in the, ma the natural tree or vine that you're grafting it in. You bandage that up. And it looks like nothing would take place. I'm always amazed at what Angie can get to grow. Sometimes she just literally breaks off something, sticks it in moist dirt, and that's it. Some things, some things root and graft that easy, and some things don't. And when you graft something in, you make a small cut in the trunk, in the side, and you put it in there and then you mechanically get it where it won't fall out. You get a get it where it'll hold in the wind. And miraculously, and I say that because it will grow in there. Miraculously. That's how you were. You were not part of the original. You were grafted in. And he said, Don't be boasting about those on the ground. Well that's Israel. You need to remember that Israel's still God's people. Amen? Verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou shalt, thou also shalt be cut off. Some people will say, well, does that mean that you can lose your salvation? Well, you, read, you need to read that. Just think about it. I'm not going to tell you what that means. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Again. I got the word again circled. I got it circled because Israel shall be grafted in again. You know, when something is cut off, when I was pruning yesterday, I cut some branches off. At the end of the day, I gathered them up and I put them in a pile. But those branches were still pliable and they still had life in them. They were still green. And had I taken one of those and trimmed it off flush at the end 
and cut a notch in the trunk and stuck it back in and taped it up where it wouldn't fall out, that thing would grow again. That's what's going to happen with Israel. Grafted in again. Verse 24, For if thou wert cut all out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So they are the natural, or they are the original people of God, if you will. And they will be grafted in again. You can be cut out, but you could also be grafted in again. Now I want to use that illustration to show you some other things in Scripture. Looking at my time, if you'll go with me to Second Thessalonians three six. Second Thessalonians three six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now, we know there's a lot of passages where we talk are told to separate ourselves from people who claim to be brothers in Christ, and yet they're living ungodly, to separate yourself from them. The churches are to put them out. Amen. You know the passages I'm talking about? But I want you to look in verse 14 and 15. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he, might, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. When someone is separated from you, that does not mean that they're cut off and there's never any hope for them. Right. And that does not mean there's never supposed to be any reconciliation. Right. Amen? Some of the things that you've had to cut out of your life because of unrighteousness may come around to be righteousness, just like Israel. Right. Get that picture. Israel will turn. Some of the things or some of the people in your life may turn. Some of the things you've put out of the past may turn. And you may come back and say, that, is, that thing is now of God. Right. Amen? Amen? It could be that maybe you were not ready to receive it. Right. It may not be right. them, it may be you. Amen? So I just wanted to tell you that, that as you read through and look at this pruning, you need to understand that some things that you may have given up on may come back to God. Some people that may you may have given up on may come back to God. Amen? Because He is a merciful God. Uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And we know that we'll be rewarded for our works, amen? That's the rewarded for the fruit that we bear. Look in verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So we have, we know that there will be some who will have things pruned out of them. And we may, in this life, think they don't have a chance. But they may, at the end, get to heaven. They may have very little fruit. Amen? But because of, because of God's love and his mercy, he is the judge. So you need to stop writing people off. You're not the judge. You need to make sure that you look at your life and prune things out of your life and out of your walk that are going to hinder you and keep you from being fruitful and productive. Amen? 
Lastly, Hebrews 12 and 6. Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is, is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasteneth, chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So this passage is talking about if you are a true son or daughter of God, you're going to be corrected, you're going to be chastened, you're going to be spanked. And if you are a good parent, you will spank your children. That's a good opportunity for you to say something, parents. Amen. Amen. If you are a good parent and you love your children, you will correct them in whatever means you have to. Amen? I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about correct them and make sure they still know that you love them. Do not beat your child and walk away mad. If you spank your child, do it with moderation and then hug them and tell them you love them. Okay? I see people that go off, they believe because they're a parent they have the right to get mad, they blow up, and they really hurt their child, and the child is crying, he hasn't learned anything. All he knows is mom or dad's mad at me. They need to understand why that they're being spanked. And they need to understand that you love them. When God is correcting you, when you're being pruned, when you're being chastened, when he's cutting things out of your life, you say, that, that's gone. That's gone forever. Well, you know what? If you could hear God's voice, he would say, well, good. I didn't want that there. When you look at that, don't be upset about it. Because he says that he loves us because we are the true children of God. If you're not being corrected by God, you need to be concerned. If you don't have something happening in your life, you need to be concerned. Because he said that we're illegitimate. Verse 8, but if you be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. So that's a good sign if you're being chastised. All right? It's a good sign. Now, as I close, I want you to think about your life and what is grow going on in your life, and what is growing in your life. Are you the, the possessor of a life that is fruitful, that is pruned, that is in order, that is beneficial to those around you? Or are you the possessor of a life that is an overgrown mess? Would you say you're an overgrown mess, or would you say you are a fruit tree that will has great potential to bear fruit. You can either fit in one of those two categories. If you are an overgrown mess, there needs to be some pruning take place. It could be that you've got way too much going on in your life. It could be mean that you've got some diseased parts. It could mean that you've got unproductive things in your life. You know, there's, there's an opportunity to spend 24 hours in a day and you've got to sleep some, but you have two-thirds of your day that you've got to do with. Now, I know some of you are in school right now, and I know your life is pretty full, but a day is coming when it won't be that way. And, the, and we have to be careful when we have too much time on our hands. I don't know how many people's lives I've seen destroyed because they got way too much time on their hands. They got into sin, they had way too much time, sometimes too much money, way too much going on in their lives, and God pruned them. Eternity is the goal, not this life. 
Amen? Eternity is the goal. Let's not forget that. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we come before you today giving you full control as we are branches in the true vine of Christ. We give you full control, Lord, over us. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. We ask, Lord, that you would help us if we have things in our life that need to be pruned out. We give them over to you, Lord, that you would take care of them. Father, if we are not uh, growing in a fruitful manner today, I pray, Lord, that you would help us do whatever it takes to us to make us fruitful for you, that our joy might be full, Lord. If our joy is not full today, Lord, remind us that it's not your fault, but it's us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.